James is a white man working as a concierge in a lovely condo in London. Security is important for him. He likes keeping things safe and he loves his job. What's so surprising about that? Not so long ago, James was sleeping in public parks and able to pay off his debts and find a job. At a certain point though, his life made a U-turn. And now he can finally enjoy some stability. Andrea is a middle-aged brunette working as an IT specialist. She used to be a massage therapist, as she likes healing people. However, the pandemic ruined her business. The loss of her only source of income, and in conflict with her roommate, almost made her go live in the streets. She was in the depth of despair. Fortunately, things are improving now. She works for the foundation that helps people get medical assistance. So she again takes care of others and feels happy with her life. Alex Stephanie is a successful startupper from London. He used to work on a popular app that helped with finding available parking spaces in a busy city. One day at a tube station, he met a homeless guy and bought him a coffee. Then, he thought whether he could help the poor man anyhow, apart from giving him money. It turned out that he could, and now James, Andrea, and more than 1,000 other homeless people are grateful to him. Because he found a way to get them on the streets and change their lives for the better. Hi, and welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we discuss stories of professionals from different spheres, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. Today, I'm going to tell you the story that shows how to successfully shift to a sphere you know virtually nothing about. The secret ingredient is to figure out how to apply the skills you already have, but in a totally different context. And by the way, this is our second episode, and we need your help. Please subscribe, rate, and leave reviews wherever you are listening to Control Shift. It will help more people to get to know our podcast. And now, to the story. Do homelessness and business have anything at all in common? Why do I care? Well, listen, in the recent decade, homelessness has become an acute problem in the UK. Around four years ago, the number of homeless people peaked. For example, according to the BBC in 2017, almost 4,750 people were sleeping on the streets every night. Every night. One of the largest charity organizations that fight homelessness called Shelters provided the following grave statistics. In 2017, about 300,000 people were homeless or had no permanent dwelling or permanent living arrangement. The latter category requires a comment. If the person stays at their friends, relatives, or in cheap hostels, they would hardly be considered homeless. Yet they are since they practice the so-called couch surfing, which is in fact hidden homelessness. It is a big part of the problem as well. There's a, a nice saying in the UK, which a lot of people know, you're only three mistakes from homelessness. This quote belongs to Timothy Paul Sattler, an executive chair at Oxford Direct Services. What he means is that it's actually quite easy to land on the street. Every person can end up homeless under certain circumstances. Indeed, reasons may vary. You know, we talk about the homeless as a group, but they are, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals with different life stories, life experiences, and need support needs to get out of homelessness. So it's about those packages, the support needed, knitting together networks of uh, support providers. I 
think when we had much less rough sleeping, people sleeping rough on the streets back at the turn of the century, it was not so much around housing services. It was about the underlying services in the UK around mental health, drug and drink addiction, uh, around support to individuals leaving the the armed services. And a lot of that fell away around the time of austerity in the UK, around post the uh, financial crash of 2009, when the controlling political party in the UK took the approach that what we needed to do was return to a small state. And lots of these services disappeared or were radically cut back. And that, I think, led to the situation where we had many more people sleeping rough than we had in the past. Well, the government fails to keep up and is not always capable of resolving different social issues. Social housing is increasingly scarce, prices for real estate are going up, and all these factors account for growing homelessness rates. Of course, the problem is worse in bigger cities. Around 50-60% to of the data I have mentioned apply exclusively to London. At the end of 2000s, a new trend was getting traction. Nowadays, city life is a clear case of the so-called sharing economy. We have plenty of convenient sharing services like Airbnb that was launched in 2008 or Uber that kicked off in 2009. Of course, today, sharing is a common practice. But at that time, it was just winning users' trust. Vertical connections are replaced by peer-to-peer ones that shape communities. Users can interact directly, which makes daily routine even easier. Around the same time in London, or even a little earlier, in 2006, a similar service appeared. It was called Park at My House and launched by Anthony Eskenazi. The idea behind it was simple and elegant. What if people who need a parking space could get in touch with people who have an empty one? Just imagine you're driving in London at rush hour. Traffic is heavy and it will take ages to park your car. Instead of contemplating the futility of life, you open the app and find out that there is an elderly couple right across the street that offers a parking space available until the evening. You can just pay them and park your car right there. Or, let's say, the day after tomorrow you go on a business trip to Bristol, so now you will be able to offer somebody your parking space. What a great solution to an obvious urban problem. However, Eskenazi's startup was not an instant success. Apparently people were not yet used to it and didn't feel safe and confident to join the new sharing practice. Gradually though, it gained popularity. Finally, in 2011, it grabbed the attention of, first, BMW iVentures, who acknowledges the startup's potential and invests £250,000 into the project. And second, Alex Stephanie, a young corporate associate who hates his job and craves changes. Wait a minute. Isn't it that Alex who used to buy coffee for a homeless man? Exactly. So far, he's fascinated by the sharing model offered by Eskenazi, and despite a fair amount of risk, decides to develop this idea further. Alex threw all his efforts into promoting his new business. Within a year, he became CEO. A few years later, The number of app users increased almost 30-fold from 25 to 700,000 people. Individuals were followed by legal entities who also started using the service. For example, hotel chains like Hilton and Holiday Inn. And parking operators. The product was updated with new features that helped analyze and forecast a number of empty parking spaces and also introduced dynamic pricing. The company even launched a beta in the US. Most importantly, the users themselves praised the app for its convenience 
and try to support it not only through registration, but also with donations. In 2015, Alex arranged a public crowdfunding campaign using one of the largest British platforms, CloudCube. The results proved that the individuals and companies were ready to invest into useful and convenient projects. The crowdfunding delivered a whopping £3.7 million investment. Besides a record number of people, 2,919 users took part in it. By all means, it was a success. A tech startup came up with a useful and convenient product that wins users' trust and brings in impressive investments. A real entrepreneurial breakthrough that could be easily rated as one of the most successful business successes or something. Alex becomes one of the leading experts on sharing economy and its visionary. He even writes a book called The Business of Sharing. And in 2016, Alex meets a homeless man sitting outside his local train station. That must have been an ordinary encounter. The kind that occurs every day in every big city. After a little chat, Alex got the man a cup of coffee, and from then on, they bumped into each other every now and then. Small talk, a hot drink, a pair of thermal socks, small attempts to help that eventually will bring out a really big idea. The thing is, this man had no permanent dwelling, but it was not the core of his problem. In one of the interviews, Alex said, He had never had a job and was illiterate. For me, the answer lay in empowering him with the skills and training to sustainably support himself. Of course, that would cost far more than coffees and socks. But what if everyone chipped in? That was how he started a crowdfunding project to help homeless people get education and find jobs. In other words, giving homeless people money to buy food is not enough. Even giving them a place to live is not enough. You need to provide them with knowledge and opportunities so they can support themselves. You know, a long-term sustainable solution address the disease rather than its symptoms. And a year later, in 2017, Alex launched a crowdfunding platform called Beam. The point of this story is that Alex was an ordinary passerby, a perfect stranger, just as we all are. He wasn't anything like Mother Teresa. He was a businessman. He had no ambitions of serving people or sacrificing himself. Moreover, he has never had any personal experience with homelessness. This clearly contradicts common understanding of charity. So I thought, what is charity like after all? When pondering this question, I see two types of charities, two extremes. The first is something basic, like one-time help. For example, a coin to a beggar. It's a simple act that brings satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment, isn't it? It is pleasant to help others after all. Or maybe you come across a post on Facebook requesting donations and make one. Or you can even send money to a charity fund every month. But this is already a higher level of awareness and social maturity. The other extreme is when you are very wealthy and charity is a part of your image. Almost like a sacred duty. Perhaps you are Angelina Jolie or Elon Musk, so you donate really big sums. You can even contact special consulting agencies to help you administer your funds. But Alex was able to find the third way. And he went for it. He figured out the way to apply his expertise in sharing economy to this new field, 
he saw that the tools he had were already enough to make it. Besides, he was full of passion for helping those in need. Of course, this was a risky twist for Alex. People chipping in for something cool that they're going to use in their daily life, like for a parking app, and contributing to something just out of kindness of their hearts, without asking for anything in return. These are different things. Remember any crowdfunding project you've ever taken part in. The goal of each campaign is always something that you believe in, you get excited about it, or it just hits your nerve. For instance, a useful device. A goal might also be to help someone you sympathize with. But why on earth should we feel anything for a random homeless person? There are other problems in the world. This is a common challenge in charity. Sick children and kittens get way more help than homeless adults. The first homeless guy educated and trained with the money collected via Beam was Tony. And he himself didn't believe it would work out. He thought no one would trust an unemployed guy living on benefits. Well, this fear is completely understandable. And Alex came up with a solution. He decided to make up for the credibility of the homeless with his own credibility. To make things as simple and transparent as it could possibly be, perfectly watertight. And as it turns out, people trust a respectable, carefully thought through platform. Tony raised nearly four and a half thousand pounds from 135 supporters, passed his exams, and got an electrician certificate. He got himself a stable job and moved out of a temporary shelter. In a couple of years, for the first time ever, he spent Christmas in his own apartment. Tony is just one of many. Today there are more than 1,200 people whom Beam helped to get back on their feet. These people literally received a new lease on life. Usually it happens like this. Beam launches a separate campaign for each person. Every campaign has a clear plan and a clear calculation how much time and money they would need to provide all the necessary help to a person. This also includes unexpected, or let's say extra, costs. For example, if Beam's client is a parent, they will need extra money on childcare, especially if they need a nanny or a nursery. So it's like a solid business project. All the expenses are transparent to a potential contributor. And good business projects get investments, right? Plus, every such project has a curator. And only after all this planning is complete, Beam launches the campaign. It is actually rather quick and takes about a month. Not bad at all for a start of new life. Okay, let's move on to the next stage. Every supporter can keep track of the whole campaign from the beginning to the end. Here, the donee begins training. And now they pass their exams and look! they get down to work. This transparency also resembles a business principle. If you decide to invest into a company, you want to have access to its statements and to be able to check on how it's all going. Finally, Beam's clients get no cash giveaways. The team controls all the spendings. This is to avoid the trust problem, which can stop people from donating. As for those who need help, they get a bonus, they can basically focus on their studies and exams. Besides, every single penny donated goes directly to the project, no corporate fees or interest. Hence, a super high success rate. Beam guarantees your money won't go down the drain. It really does look like a business project. You can easily tell that Alex came to charity from a startup. All in all, seems like a success story and truly in the vein of modern charity. Today, it's not about service or self-sacrifice. It is a business issue. At the extreme, there is a concept called effective altruism, coined by Peter Singer and William Mark Askell. 
that's a social movement and a philosophical school of thought, kind of a lens through which we can view charity. The idea is that any good deed, even if it comes from the bottom of your heart, must be carefully thought through. Because, you know, lots of things that seem right and noble may be nothing near, may be useless. Broadly speaking, you've given some cash to a homeless guy who squanders it away on a drink. And if you gave the same sum to a charity foundation, it would guarantee efficient use of your money. Another example. We could buy lots of books, notebooks, and school uniform sets for Kenyan children to improve their level of training. Or we could run a research and see that cheap medicine for parasitic infections increases their performance 10 times as much as stationary and even scholarships. So, spending money on proper medicine will bring better results than taking obvious measures. In other words, effective altruism says, you want to help? Then make sure you know what you're about to do. Is there another way? Less obvious, more efficient. Definitely, this efficiency of beam was what hooked me. At the same time, we can get another angle on this. Well, let's look at numbers. Remember, I mentioned the scale of homelessness in the UK these days. 300,000 unhoused people. Do you remember how many campaigns Beam launched? 1,200 in five years. Yeah. And I look at these numbers and think, what does it mean for the world? Isn't it a drop in the ocean? I've got yet another question. What if Alex went on with his parking project, became even more successful, probably a billionaire, and could donate tons of money, get consultations from charity experts and do even more good? like build 10,000 houses. Well, there is always this quality-quantity trade-off in charity. Tim Sadler from Oxford Direct Services says there are two main approaches to helping the homeless. Housing first, when you help homeless people get some kind of lodging. And a more customized approach like beating addictions, which is a common reason for homelessness. Or providing documents, jobs, the first approach is probably up to the government, indeed it's the only actor in that capacity. But if we do some digging, it turns out that the second one may be actually more efficient. Companies like Beam can't provide everyone with a cushy spot. But what they can do is take a fresh look and cover the aspects unreachable to the government. You just made me, you saying that made me think of one of the little innovations I saw recently was that one of the NGOs operating in Oxford has deliberately sought work clothes for exchange. And they have in their uh, premises now, like at a shop, but it's a shop with no money. You're going for an interview for a job, you need a nice shirt, tie, suit, maybe. Try something on, see what works for you, and it's yours. So that's, you know, it's just an, an example of someone spotting a need and dealing with it. But I think it also shows shows the myriad of bits and pieces that are needed to make a successful return to work and therefore being able to pay rent and then end your cycle of homelessness. Someone spotting a need and dealing with that. Sounds like a conventional startup description, right? And Beam was born exactly like that. Because Alex has spotted a need on that tube station. One startupper saw an opportunity to help and took the risk of shifting to a new, unknown field. And it worked, because some business skills perfectly fit social work. The point is that Beam is an effective tool, which can be applied to scores of people. Alex often says that he would like to create a transparent, well-functioning scheme scalable for various cities and even countries. and. Considering that the problem of homelessness is likely to get worse, and that governments are struggling to deal with it, our best hope lies with horizontal communities involving ordinary people, like Alex, like you and me.
Control Shift was brought to you by Libo Libo Studio and Humble Team. Music for this episode was created by Kira Weinstein and also special thanks to Blue Dot Session. We got a whole lot of people working on this podcast. Credits to all of them are in the description of the episode. And I am your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in the next one.